All right, so we're going to talk about diving emergencies. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Those are all the groups that I currently work for, but UF Health Jacksonville Trauma One Flight Services is my current main employer, and that's what brings me here today. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, very first, uh, this link right here will take you to everything you need to know about this talk. All right. This link has the handout that will have everything I'm going to talk about. Uh, it'll have uh, references. It'll have my contact information, most importantly, if you have any questions down the road. I'm recording this right now, and hopefully in a week or so I'll have it up there as well uh, with video recording. So the main idea is just sit back, relax, don't worry about taking notes. Everything you need to know will be on that, and that will be on my last slide as well. So we're going to talk about scuba diving. This is my wife and I diving in Blue Grotto. That's about 10, 15 minutes up the road here. Very cool dive place. Uh, we're going to talk about scuba diving. So that's where you take a contain a unit of air underwater. Very different from free diving, where you take your breath and go down. Uh, so they're different disease entities based on the type of diving you're doing, but this is what we're going to talk about today. So who here scuba dives? Awesome, fantastic. This is a really cool area of the country to be a scuba diver and very unique diving. It is inherently dangerous. You're taking a human who's supposed to be above the water, uh, giving him a thing of air and saying, go down 100, 200, 300 feet. And it is inherently dangerous. There are reasons why people die every year doing this, especially in this area. We have very ballsy, for lack of a better word, divers in this area that, that follow the systems underground. And it, again, um, there's very little room for air uh, in this sport. But it's a very satisfying and rewarding sport uh, if it's uh, something that you like to do. So to start off, we'll talk about physics. Hey, good, we got some people from the 80s here. Uh, we'll talk about physics. This is very important. Every disease entity and treatment is based on the physics of diving. So you have to have a very basic understanding. I'm going to talk about different laws and rules and all this stuff. It's not that important that you internalize it, but they have a basic understanding of what happens to your body when you go underwater. So first off, the deeper we go, the more pressure is around our, our body as a system. And the way I like to think about that is thinking of water as unit of units of matter. And as you go farther, farther down, you have more of those units of matter sitting on top of you. We feel a certain amount of pressure here while we stand on the surface because we have air that has mass sitting on top of us. As we go down, more of that mass is around us. So if we're at the surface, we're at one atmosphere of air. Once we get down to 33 feet, then we're at, we actually have a whole additional atmosphere of air surrounding us and surrounding our bodies. And as we go down to 66 feet, we didn't add another atmosphere of pressure. Um, so you can see pretty rapidly your body is experiencing pressures in environments it's not, it's not generally used to. So the very first law we'll talk about is Boyle's Law. And what this says is for a fixed pressure, we'll call that pressure one, and a fixed volume, as the volume changes or as the pressure changes, the other entity uh, changes inversely. All right? I'll show you a little uh, depiction to, to understand that a little bit better. So volume on the left here, we have a volume of fixed gas, we have a fixed pressure on top of it. As that pressure increases, so as the system increases pressure, that volume has to shrink. It has to decrease based on, based on Boyle's law. And we'll see where that comes into play when we talk about diving injuries. So say we take a container of gas, any type of gas, down to the bottom of the ocean. We fill a balloon with that gas. So now that, that balloon has a fixed volume um, of gas in a certain pressure. If we then bring that balloon up in the water, so now the pressure is actually decreasing because we're coming back to the surface, that volume is going to actually expand. You see this if you ever take a can down the, in the bottom of the water or if you're on an airplane with Ziploc bags and chip bags. That's why we have this expansion and contraction of volume. If it goes up even further, our volume expands more. and we come to the surface, it may actually rupture the system. So we can see how that might be an issue when we're talking about the body. Um, more importantly is that this effect is much larger toward the surface. So as we get in those last five to ten feet, that expansion of volume based on change in pressure, it's much greater than it is way far down. And we'll see that's the reason why we have certain injuries that are actually more common to happen in those last five to ten feet. We think about being down 60, 80, 100 feet being dangerous, but actually this last five or ten feet can actually be the danger zone, especially when we're talking about uh, breath hold dives. The next law we'll talk about, Henry's Law. So what this says is the amount of gas that's dissolved in the solution is related to the surrounding pressure. So on the left, at one atmosphere of pressure, we have a certain amount of gas that's dissolved in that solution. If we increase that gas, we double it, we now increase the amount of that gas that's dissolved in the solution. And we'll think about our solution as our blood. So as we go deeper in the water, whatever gas that we're breathing uh, is going to dissolve more into our blood. And again, we'll see why that can become an issue. 
So again, at the surface, near the surface, certain amount of gas in that diver's blood. As he descends down, more and more of that gas goes into solution into his blood. So it's nice to kind of differentiate between injuries of descent and injuries of ascent because they're very different entities. So on injuries of descent, again, we'll kind of go back to that physics talk. We have a fixed volume of gas on that surface. So say we take a balloon, a ball, whatever, has one atmosphere of air, it has that ambient air on the surface. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to start bringing that fixed volume of air underwater. So the, that, that pressure inside that balloon is still one atmosphere. All right? But the surrounding pressure is now two atmospheres. What we get is a relative vacuum. The pressure inside that ball is less than the ambient pressure, and we get a relative vacuum. And this can cause some of our more benign injuries that we'll see, like mask squeeze. So this person may come in your emergency department, you may pick them up on the rig, and you say, holy shit, what's happened to this person? But it's actually a fairly benign thing. You've just taken a fixed volume of gas, they went on the surface, they put that mask on with ambient air, they went down 33 feet, now they have a relative vacuum, and they're just popping blood vessels in their eyes. Okay, it looks scary, but that's the physics and the reason behind it. Fairly benign condition, uh, doesn't really need any treatment. The same can be said for sinus injuries. So you can get rupture of sinuses, it's very, very rare, but more commonly what you get, you get a relative vacuum in the sinus, pulls mucus, pulls blood, stuff into the sinuses. So the person may come in coughing blood or uh, uh, blowing their nose, having blood coming out, or just having really stuffed sinuses. Uh, this is a good reason why if you're a diver or if you're advising divers, if they're sick, it's probably not a good day to dive. Because you, you have to rely on the plumbing of all your, your body, especially up in your head and neck area, to be working to allow these fluid shifts uh, to go um, unhindered. So treatment for this, again, best to discontinue diving if you have a patient that's experiencing these things. They're benign, but it's best to discontinue diving. Avoid diving if you're sick. Take decongestants. Usually if I'm going to dive, I'll go ahead and start taking decongestants the night before, just so my body's kind of ready to go. Otherwise, benign condition. Same thing can happen in the ear system. So our ear is a, is a closed system within the inner ear. And again, usually we have uh, ambient atmospheric air in that middle ear section. This is why when we go up in an airplane, what happens is now I have one atmosphere, I go high, so I'm actually going to less pressure. So the inside of my ear is higher pressure than the outside, so my tympanic membrane, my eardrum, is pushing out. That's why I experience that pain when you're on an airplane. And what do we do to combat that? You can hold your nose and blow. What that does is take that pressure from the outside air, put it inside your ear canal, so now both sides of the ear, eardrum are equal. So again, we have one atmosphere of air. We now go down. So one atmosphere inside. We go down 33 feet. We have two atmospheres on the outside. We now have a pressure opposite of when we're in the airplane. This time, the pressure is actually pushing in. Same sensation. You get an ear squeeze, and it hurts, uh, but there, that's the reason for it. So again, because of this, you can get a relative vacuum inside that ear canal, you actually get fluid buildup inside the ear canal. So what this can cause is issues he uh, hearing, um, issues with balance. Um, it can just mainly cause discomfort for the most part. And this is the main reason I take de decongestants. I have terrible ears, and so I, this is a big problem for me when I dive. I have a very hard time uh, equalizing. Uh, the most serious complication is rupture. So this is tapan uh, eardrum tympanic membrane that's ruptured. You're now seeing the inside of the ear, which you don't want to see. Uh, but that's fairly rare, but it can happen. So usually intense pressure and pain. Um, often it's actually a lot of pain followed by relief. The multiple times I've ruptured my eardrum for various reasons, it was a lot of pain, a lot of pain, and boom, it ruptured. And I'm like, oh, that, that feels better. But the problem is that I actually ruptured my eardrum. Uh, so this is a more serious condition. Uh, one reason is because the person can now become vertiginous. So now they have cold water or colder relative than their body flowing into the inner ear and they can start spinning out. Super vertiginous, dizzy. Now they're underwater where their life depends on being able to be under control and breathe through a tank and they might be 100 feet down and now they're dizzy. Uh, so people have actually died from this. Um, it can, can be, uh, be pretty scary. So if a uh, uh, diver comes up and we suspect this, um, it's best to have them discontinue diving, uh, follow up with an, an ENT doctor, uh, someone that can maybe fix that eardrum. Some people might be lucky enough to be able to breathe through their ears. Uh, so this guy right here, you see he holds his nose and blows, bubbles coming out of his ear. Again, I've had several times in my life where I could actually do this. I didn't know that, but I could, I could actually do it. Because again, when you hold your nose and blow, all you're doing is allowing air to pass through this little tube that connects your neck to your ear and equalize the air. So if you have a hole in your eardrum, all the air does is pass out. Um, it passes out through the uh, tympanic membrane and out to the, out to the outside. 
treatment for this, uh, like I said, go ahead and they need to discontinue diving, obviously. Follow up with an ENT surgeon. Avoid any water activity. Uh, this is the dangerous thing because if, if you know someone like this, it says, oh, I got a ruptured eardrum, it's okay. No, dude, you need to stay out of the water. This is what happens, very high risk of infection, very high risk of eroding the actual small bones inside your ear that help you hear. Uh, so this person needs to keep that ear completely dry um, until they're able to follow up with an ENT. All right, so now in, indirect effects of pressure as we, as we descend. So now we have Dalton's Law. So we talked about Boyle's and Henry's law, and what Dalton's law says is as you increase the pressure in the system or around the system, you are breathing more of that air in. So I already said more of that gas gets dissolved in your blood, but now you're actually experiencing more impact from the air. So right now we're breathing about 21% oxygen, um, and a certain amount is getting in our bloodstream. If we go into a hyperbaric chamber, we're actually going to be breathing higher concentrations of oxygen. So as we go down, we bring that thick system of gas with us, we're going to be bringing more partial pressure of that gas into our, into our bloodstream. And that can have some uh, pretty bad effects. So all this gas that we breathe up here on on land, it's okay. We breathe about 21% oxygen, 70 something percent nitrogen. And that's the same mix that's in most scuba tanks. So normal air tank, all they do is take the air around us, put it in a cylinder and put it on your back. So it's the same air you're breathing up here. Again, that's fine and dandy up here, but as we get down below and we get in a system with higher pressure around us, we are now dissolving more of that gas in our bloodstream. And you have danger of developing stuff like nitrogen narcosis. Okay, nitrogen's okay for us on the surface, but as we experiencing higher levels due to pressure around us, you can actually have some pretty bad clinical effects. And nitrogen narcosis, also known as rapture of the deep, essentially people just start acting drunk. And again, not something you want when you're 100 feet down. This diver on the right just looked back and realized his buddy ain't acting right. He stopped, he stopped kicking, now he's just kind of sinking, he's descending too fast, and now he's realized something's wrong with this guy, he probably has nitrogen narcosis, and he's, he's he luckily diving with a buddy who's smart enough to say, all right man, we need to go back to the surface. This next video I show will be a more controlled environment. Uh, they're actually in a hyperbaric chamber making themselves become nitrogen narcosis, and we can see the effects of that. <laughs> Having the time of their lives. Yeah, they're doing nothing other than just being in a high pressure area, a high pressure environment. And fine and dandy, fun on the surface, being 100 feet down, there, there are plenty of cases of people dying because um, they continue to go deeper. They don't, in their mind, say, oh, I'm having a great time. And they keep going deeper. There's people that take their regulator out and say, oh, look at me, doing backflips and stuff. And people die because of it. So that's, it's pretty crazy that that can actually be that dangerous. Oxygen toxic, toxicity, again, on the surface, oxygen's great. We love oxygen. It helps us breathe. It helps us survive. But as we go farther and farther down, we actually run the risk of becoming oxygen toxic. And actually, there's a very kind of slim uh, area of danger for this if, if, we, if we don't practice right. So here's some 1940s U.S. Navy videos. This is when you could actually do stuff like this in medicine um, and get away with it. And they had this guy in a hyperbaric chamber breathing pure oxygen. And you can see pretty rapidly he starts getting tetany. He starts getting spasms in his hands. And pretty soon down the road, he's in full convulsion. That's just, he's just breathing pure oxygen in an increased pressure environment. Um, so you can see how dangerous that can be. Again, and this is... Yeah, <laughs> you used to be able to do this shit. It's amazing. Um, so, but again, that's just regular oxygen. Um, and it has to do with the mixes that you're diving with, but this is another danger. Again, you imagine having a Caesar 100 feet down, uh, generally a bad thing. Uh, so the big thing with those two entities is that the symptoms and the disease resolve with resurfacing. Once you take the body back up toward a normal pressure and allow that partial pressure of, of the gases normalize, these things resolve. They don't generally need any other treatment. Hyperbarics isn't actually indicated. So you might get on the rig or the helicopter be in the ED and someone says, hey, my buddy, he was acting weird. We were 80 feet down. I brought him up. He's been normal ever since. That's probably nitrogen narcosis. They generally don't need much um, because that's, that's the um, whole cause of the disease. So injuries of ascent. So these are the injuries that happen when you're actually coming back up from below. So just as before, we have our, our tympanic membrane, and we have that differential pressure. So we have one atmosphere inside the inner ear canal. We have two atmospheres on the outside. So this person has come down, and now what they're going to do, they're going to equalize. They're going to hold their nose and blow. And what that's going to do is it's going to increase that pressure on the inside of the ear canal. It's going to try to equal it out to two atmospheres, and now you're fine and dandy feeling good. 
uh, that's great and all, but you can come back up to the surface, and if that air doesn't, if that pressure doesn't relieve from the middle ear, you get reverse squeeze. So now you have higher pressure trying to push out. This is what I have a big problem with uh, when I ascend. I ascend slower than anyone you've ever seen because I have to swallow every two to three seconds uh, with a very dry mouth because I have to open my eustachian tube. Otherwise, I can't relieve the pressure and it feels like my head is going to explode because my TM, my tympanic membrane, is just pushing itself out. So this is extremely uncomfortable. Uh, but you may, if, if people have this problem, the big thing is just ascending very slowly and planning ahead knowing you're going to have to have enough gas to do that. So same physiology as before, just reversed. Yes, you can blow out your eardrum. This is probably gonna be more common to blow out the eardrum with this. So again, if someone comes up, they say, man, I felt intense pressure, and ooh, it went away, and now I got a weird taste in my mouth, they probably blew out their eardrum. Uh, treatment as before, uh, getting the patient to an ENT um, and keeping the ear dry as well. So the lungs are a major system when, we, when we're diving. When we're talking about prefer, pressure differentials and air, air volumes and stuff, the lungs, we have to think about the lungs. So are injuries of ascent with the lung, high risk are the very beginning divers. Uh, where they freak out, something happens, and they shoot to the surface. This is a very high risk behavior. You see all these people are on these lines, they're probably on a cruise ship where they take about a 48 hour dive class and now they're quote unquote certified. Uh, but the, the danger with this is luckily he was breathing that gas out, but if he shoots up to the surface, now we're getting, gonna get problems with actually possible pneumothoraces. You can see the first thing that guy did was boom, up to the surface. But an experienced diver, when something goes wrong, they at least have the calm and the mindset to understand, I need to calmly try to get to the surface while at the same time expelling that air from my lungs so I don't cause injury. Because again, fixed volume of gas down in the bottom. Uh, we have our alveoli here. If we start resurfacing without relieving that pressure, we won't go back to Boyle's law, the pressure around us is decreasing, the volume increases, we can now get rupture of the alveoli. Fine and dandy, uh, but the problem is we can get a pneumothorax from that, which sucks. But even more importantly and more deadly is arterial gas embolism. So this is probably one of the most deadly things we think about when someone's diving. And this is what you have to think about if someone goes into full cardiac arrest or completely syncopizes or has stroke-like symptoms in the first couple minutes from resurfacing, this is probably what happened. So you get a rupture of the lung, you get air out into the pleural, pleural space in the vasculature, and those air bubbles actually start embolizing. They go up to the brain, they can cause stroke, they can go to the heart, they can cause a cardiac arrest or MI. Um, so this is very, very dangerous and this is a very uh, deadly disease. So treatment for this, a presentation we'll talk about first, mainly they present like this, unconscious. The unfortunate part is about 4% die immediately. So 4% of people who experience this, they die. There ain't nothing you can do about it. Another 5% usually die in the hospital. And this is due to just the embolism itself or drowning. So again, they come to the surface, this happens, and now you got a body floating in the water and they could potentially drown. Uh, so usually sudden loss of consciousness, a uh, pulselessness. The symptoms usually happen the first 10 minutes. Okay, um, and mostly in the first 10 minutes, but also in the first two minutes is gonna be the most common. So again, this is that patient that comes up to the surface for whatever reason, and suddenly they collapse, or suddenly they go unconscious. You have to think about this, because this is a very deadly disease. And the problem is there ain't much you can do about it, honestly, um, especially if you're out in the environment. Uh, but things we're gonna do, we're gonna provide oxygen. So a good dive boat is one that has a, a good BLS uh, case or BLS kit on it with oxygen with positive pressure ventilation devices uh, because that's gonna be really the only thing you can possibly do. Um, if you're on a transport unit, you're gonna try to give them fluids to bolster their blood pressure to avoid things like the stroke-like symptoms that we're seeing. You're gonna get high flow O2, so whatever way you can possibly give high flow O2. Uh, keep the patient supine. You don't really wanna be shifting Trendelenburg and stuff because then you have issues with the way that the air bubbles might be traveling, and then rapid transport to the ED. Ideally, you want to go to a hyperbaric center. Ed and I were just talking about this. This is a nightmare to figure out where these things are. My very last slide is going to talk about how to find a hyperbaric center, uh, but this is going to be your mainstay of treatment um, because we'll, we'll talk about why that is, but we have to redive these patients and try to get those bubbles uh, to get out of the bloodstream. Along these same lines is decompression sickness. And this is kind of a, a little subject in and of itself because this is what we really worry about the most. And all the dive tables and safety measures we have in drowning are kind of based around this disease entity. So again, we have our oxygen tank here. Uh, it's, it's filled with the air that's around us. So it's about 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. So on the surface, we're breathing that air. Again, as we go down, more of that gas, both all those gases dissolve into our bloodstream. 
So here, again, we're deep down, we have nitrogen, it's now dissolved in our bloodstream, it's part of our bloodstream. If we have a rapid ascent to the surface, that nitrogen that's, that's dissolved in solution now comes out, it bubbles out within our bloodstream. That's badness, okay? We haven't given our body time to equilibrate and time to get that gas out of our system. It now just comes out in bubble form because the pressure around it has decreased. And you can imagine how that can be a problem. So now we have bubbles in our bloodstream. Uh, generally not a, not a great thing. Um, it can affect any system you really think of. The main things we think of are neurologic in the uh, ears, in the pulmonary system, uh, the skin, musculoskeletal systems as well. Uh, so we'll talk, kind of talk about each one. The big difference when we talked about arterial gas embolism, that was usually in the first two to 10 minutes. This one is usually in the couple hours and almost all of them are in the first 24 hours. So this is how you differentiate. Again, generally it's usually not gonna be most of your guys' job to really seal a diagnosis. You're just trying to stabilize and get to the right area. Uh, but this is what we're starting to think of. Okay, the person went diving, they came up a little fast. Six hours later, they started think, worrying about back pain and maybe have some neurologic symptoms. That's when we start thinking about decompression sickness and not so much the arterial gas embolism. The risk is it's associated with uh, increased multiple days of, of multiple dives. So this is dangerous when someone goes down to Bonaire for two or three days. They're like, I'm going for three days, one of the best diving spots, I'm gonna dive as much as possible. And boom, 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 boom. They're diving all day for three days straight. That's where it's very dangerous because now you're increasing the amount of time you're spending on the bottom, you're increasing the amount of gas that you have dissolved in the solution, you're increasing the, the risk of that gas actually bubbling out. And it's related to time and depth as well. So the amount of time you spend at certain depths. And then again, that's the difference. Below 30 feet, that a diver does dives below 30 feet, comes up and starts developing symptoms that more commonly that's going to be de decompression sickness. If the diver stays above 30 feet, comes up and has immediate symptoms, more commonly it's going to be the arterial gas embolism. And again, that has to do with how we talked about that effect of the rapid expansion having uh, more effect in the shower de shallower depths. So any divers in here will recognize what this is. Anyone else will say, what the hell is that? That's a dive table. So these are the US Navy dive tables. And these are very helpful because what this does, it tells me how long I can stay at a certain depth. And we won't go through the dive table, but in general it says, okay, I, I can say I know what gas I'm carrying. I know how deep I wanna go. Generally, if you're diving somewhere, you know the depth. Okay, I'm going to Blue Grotto and it's uh, 90 feet down. So here's how long I can stay safely at 90 feet. Um, because usually I have to come out because my air is running out. But if I had three tanks with me, I could stay down there for a long time. But there's a certain time based on, on, on uh, data that tells me how long I can be down and not have to do a decompression stop. So then I can also switch over and say, how long do I need to be on the surface before I should dive again? And there are more tables saying, if I do a second dive, how long I can be down? So most of this is built into watches now that uh, divers carry, but the whole point of this is staying within a nice safety margin so you're not having to worry about uh, decompression at all. Any nitrox divers in here? So nitrox is, is kind of a cool thing, and it's just a different gas mix. So what it does is somewhat mitigate these issues by increasing oxygen and decreasing nitrogen. So again, the problem we have with a lot of this with decompression sickness is from nitrogen bubbling out in the system. So where we usually breathe 21% oxygen, a nitrox mix augments that. So generally you'll breathe more of a 30 to 32% oxygen. So what that does is bring the nitrogen load down. So by that, by doing so, you can actually stay at deeper depths for longer. So a lot of us like this because it's a better safety margin as long as you know what you're doing. Um, you can go for a longer time, or sometimes double your, your bottom time depending on where you are. And you're just spending more time down there not worrying about decompression sickness. But as you see the whole yellow thing, it's just a whole different dive table. It's a different way of maintaining and filling your tanks. Uh, so it's, just, it's a whole different course that you take, but it's become pretty popular with recreational diving. So that's how we prevent it. But if the patient gets it, here gets the disease, here are th some things you might see are mild form. You generally know neurologic symptoms. You can often get joint pain, uh, back pain, or a rash. Uh, so the joint pain are usually maybe elbows, knees. You can also get in the back. Um, I saw a guy maybe with this a couple years ago. We were diving with a group, and he came up, and about an hour later, he's like, oh, my back's killing me. He's like, oh, I've never really had this pain before. I don't really get back pain. It was probably nothing, but we had to say, dude, you got to stop diving. I mean, sorry, like this could actually be an early sign that you had decompression sickness. So it sucks to tell someone, especially if they've traveled, um, that you need to actually stop diving. There's a test that they talk about for this where you can actually put a blood pressure cuff over the affected joint and increase the blood pressure cuff. 
So if we go back and think about our physics, what's that, what that does is increase the surrounding pressure that allows that solution to go back into, and allows that gas to go back into solution and then and, and take, take it away from the joint space. So you should get a relief of pain. It's not a great test. It doesn't, if it's negative, it doesn't really mean anything. But if it's positive, it kind of, it kind of points to the fact that the patient may have decompression sickness. And then in terms of the rash, generally they can just kind of get a, modeling, a modeled uh, skin around the chest and shoulders. Again, benign, but it can be a harbinger of things to come. So if you're diving or talking to divers and they start getting the stuff, I'm sorry, but you've got to stop diving. Like, yeah, and you're showing nothing right now, but your next dive could be your last dive. So, Treatment-wise, same as before, uh, ABCs, high flow O2. Even if their O2 sat's 100%, we've got to start high flow on these folks. Stop the dive, get into the ED, um, and then we're going to talk about uh, hyperbaric consultation in a second. Uh, type 2 DCS is your more severe form, so we start getting neurologic spinal issues. Uh, we start getting pulmonary and cardiac issues. So people can get paralysis, because now you're bubbling in your spinal cord. Um, again, you can have uh, MI, essentially large pulmonary embolism. You get mood changes, loss of consciousness, weakness, numbness, paralysis. So all this would scare the shit out of you if someone just came out of the water or came out of the water in the last 24 hours, because this could be really, something really dangerous. And again, talking about shortness of breath, they suddenly have sudden shortness of breath, chest pain. You can think of this as a large pulmonary embolism. Just like if we're doing a procedure in the ED or in, or in a lab somewhere and we accidentally bolus a, a nice bolus of air, that can get trapped in their lungs. And that can cause essentially a large pulmonary embolism, and it's very deadly. And then hearing and balance. Um, I had a friend whose dad had this. He started bubbling in his inner ear while he was diving and just started spinning out. And uh, luckily made up to surface, but same thing. All it was was little bubbles in his ear uh, tickling the wrong nerves and making them spin out. So treatment, just as before, high flow O2, uh, IV fluids, resuscitate, resuscitate as you usually would, and get the patients to a higher level of care as fast as you can. If we're going to transport by air, if you're in a fixed swing, uh, you're going to pressurize the sea level. Um, again, we, we want this person's body uh, to try to be around uh, the, right, the right pressure. We're not really going to do hyperbarics on the plane, but as we go up, we drop our pressure more. We drop our ambient pressure. So now we're taking a system that already has bubbled nitrogen, dropping the pressure more, we cause more bubbling. So we at least want to try to pressurize the sea level. And if we're in an unpressured cabin like a, a helicopter, we want to go ahead and try to fly below 1,000 feet. So we'll talk about hyperbarics real quick. Uh, so why do we do hyperbarics? Well, the main reason we do it, it's essentially a controlled dive. It's a dry dive. We are recreating this dive. Again, the reason this person's nitrogen bubble in their blood is because they came back up to the surface to, to our one atmosphere of pressure. So we need to try to dive them back down. And it's generally very unsafe to take that person and just take them underwater. So what a hyperbaric chamber does, it simulates that for us. So a person's up on the surface, they have bubbled nitrogen in their blood. What we're going to do, we're going to simulate and dive them down by making the pressure in the room around them, making that pressure much higher. It's going to make those bubbles get smaller, hopefully allow those bubbles to leave the system, and then we can slowly bring that patient back up to the surface. And now, hopefully, the damage that um, isn't too far gone, and hopefully the nitrogen down their system. This is all based on U.S. Navy dive tables they've been using for centuries. They're all outdated. But again, this is, one, this is something you can't really test. Um, you can test the effects of gases on people, but you can't really make people get decompression sickness and then uh, put them in a chamber. So it really, it, it's still an evolving science. So where is the closest dive chamber? So the main, main answer usually is we don't know. I only know it is Advent Health in Orlando because we had to call them recently. Uh, but it's kind of scary. We have a very big dive community here in Gainesville. There's a very big dive, very big dive community in Jacksonville. Jacksonville, we have no public access dive chamber. The Navy has one that we can't access. Uh, Baptists used to have one. They closed it a couple of years ago. Why are they, why are they closing down all over the place? No proper trained positions. No, no proper what? Trained positions. That's, that's one. Why else? Why more importantly? There ain't no money in it. Yeah, there aren't many trained physicians. It's a specialty training. There's no money in it. The money in hyperbarics is in wound care. And there's two different types of chamber. There's a single plex and a multiplex. A multiplex chamber can take multiple people in there. You can take a doctor in there with a patient, with a tech and a nurse. You can resuscitate this patient and treat them. A single chamber is like a coffin, essentially, and you put one person in there. And that's for your wound care and your diabetic ulcers. And there's much more money in that. You can reimburse that. You can't reimburse the other one. So these things are closing all over the country. So it's a big problem. Again, if I... 
10 years ago before I knew any of this, so I, if I had a diver in Jacksonville, I'd be, great, let's, let's dive and let's find a chamber, but not realizing they aren't anywhere. And like I said, currently, as far as I know, Orlando does have an active chamber. Uh, but the main thing is don't ever try to memorize it because it'll probably change tomorrow. Uh, so you just need to have this number. And this is actually a number, I think this number should be in all your protocols if it isn't already. Uh, this is a number that I have in my cell phone in case I come across any divers that need help or I need help myself. And this is the Divers Alert Network. Uh, they are based out of Durham, North Carolina, Duke University. They have some experts. And Divers Alert Network is a fantastic resource for divers uh, for a couple reasons. One reason is this. Um, again, this number is, is uh, answered 24-7. hour, 24 seven. And what they can do is start helping you find a dive chamber. Um, you can, they can at least say, okay, you're this part of the country, you have this. They can talk about the symptoms. Okay, yes, we recommend uh, diving the patient. No, we don't. And they can tell you where the active chambers are. They have the most up-to-date database. So again, I think in any EMS protocol, it'd be a good idea to at least have this number in there because they're a good resource. Ed and I were talking earlier, and sometimes you might get some pushback from them and other folks saying, why would you take them to the emergency department? They should have gone to Advent Orlando for that diving. And you have to say, look, we had to do what's right for the patient. We have to resuscitate them first, and we can't just wait to find out where the closest chamber is. So really get the patient to the right center, but then um, you can start finding where they need to go if they need to go. Another good plug for Dan, uh, Divers Alert Network, for any divers in there, really anyone. If you become a member of Dan, it's 50 bucks or 55 bucks a year, I think, for your family. Uh, then for the entire year, you get their traveler's insurance. And their traveler's insurance covers you anywhere you travel 50 miles outside your hometown. And what that does, you don't have to be diving. But if you get hurt or injured to the point that you need to be extricated or evacuated from the area, you call them and they help set it up for you. Um, and then they can help uh, fund it and all that stuff for you. Um, so instead of some people get di uh, travel insurance for every trip they go on, if you've paid that money at the beginning of the year, you get their monthly magazine and then you're covered all year round. So again, a, a nice little plug. I just think it's a cool resource for anyone who travels a lot. Uh, finally, when we talked about diving, again, I talked about earlier, it's not really safe to just, we could just take these patients back underwater and redive them and not have to fly them to another state to get a hyperbaric chamber. But you can see that's pretty dangerous. But there are pe people who do this, um, and it's called in-water recompression. Again, all we need to do is increase the pressure around these patients so you can actually dive them back down. And this is going to be more common in your industrial diving, commercial diving, um, commercial diving uh, environments. But you may be on a boat with someone that says, hey, let's just go, let's go redive them. And just say, okay, pump the brakes, dude. Um, this takes special training. It takes special, this person has a special tank that they're going down with. They have a full face mask. They can talk with the crew on the surface. So you may actually see this on boats or rigs that are far out to sea, and they're not going to be evacuating people. Uh, back and forth, uh, but again, on a regular recreational boat, it's probably not the best idea. So how do we prevent this? Well, there's plenty of safety uh, protocols built into diving. Here you're going to see a nice, safe resurfacing. Anyone who dives this will be familiar to you. Uh, these are folks that are talking back and forth. They say, okay, we're going to resurface, and now what they're going to do, they're going to resurface in a very cold, uh, controlled and slow manner. So the current recommendations generally are to resurface about 30 feet a minute, and the current little computers we have, you used to have to kind of do it in your head, but now they'll tell you how fast you're resurfacing. So the computer I have will start flashing and beeping saying, you're going too fast, you're going too fast. Because what I'm doing, if I go at that 30 feet per minute, it's allowing my body to get the, uh, the gases out of solution or out into solution out of my body. You then do a safety stop about five feet, uh, I mean 15 feet for three to five minutes. And you just kind of sit there and you just breathe normally. So again, allowing your body to metabolize, allowing your body to bring gases in solution, allowing yourself to breathe it off. Uh, it's kind of, it's definitely kind of overkill. You could probably safely resurface as long as you haven't been down too long and based on your gas mix. But this is just one of those nice cushions. You, if you do this, you know you're probably going to be pretty safe. So any of you divers out there, uh, no matter how long you've been doing it, st stick to your safety stops. It's really the only way to stay safe. And then finally, one last plug for when you're the person on scene, whether that be in a transport vehicle, the rig, the helicopter, whatever, try to find out the dive details because you may be the only one that really gets that um, to give the ED crew or give whoever you're handing the patient off to. And this is what it all comes down to. We have to know what happened to this patient. And by the time they get to the hospital, they may be unconscious and their buddies may not be with them. But we need to know what their symptoms are, when they developed, the depth, the time, the number of dives, the safety stops if they did them in the gas mix. 
So again, when I want to know what type of gas were they using, were they using air, were they using nitrox, were they using a rebreather system, what was their nitrox mix, um, how, down, how far down they go, how long did they go down for, and how many times did they do that? And then did they do their safety stops? Because these are going to be questions we're going to have to ask, uh, talk to the dive chamber, and it's going to kind of change your management. I saw a hand up there. I'll get you in a second. Uh, because maybe if this person went down 15 feet for 10 minutes, and they came up and did safety stops, and now they have stroke-like symptoms, they probably had a stroke. It probably wasn't, <laughs> it probably wasn't decompressing sickness. So it might stop me from doing hyperbarics on this patient and actually doing TPI on this patient. So it really helps to know the dive details. Hand. Yes. Thank you for saying that because I forgot to put that in there. Um, yeah, if you could bring the dive computer. The dive computer has all the data. Dive computers these days are ridiculous machines. They have every step of the way that you did. They're so amazing at this point, if you dive 20, too many times within 24 hours, it'll lock you out and it won't let you dive. Um, because you're now at a higher risk, you can't fly home, you have higher risk decompression sickness, so actually will lock out and won't let you dive. That's a great thing. If you're going to grab any piece of equipment, um, just try to note the type of gas they have. Or if you bring your dive computer, it will know what type of gas you have. Because if you have nitrox, you actually have to, um, to calculate it in or punch it in. Around here, with our cave diving, you're going to have some complex systems people are using. Multi-tanks, different rebreathers, different weird mixes, tri-mix and all this stuff. So just try to get the most information you can or have one of their buddies come along with them that can tell them what's going on. All right, so in a very quick review, uh, high flow O2 on all sick patients. If you're the one unseen, you can't go wrong with high flow O2 with these patients. Uh, discontinue the diving. Again, if you get unseen and someone says, oh yeah, I, I felt terrible before, I had these weird pains, but I feel great now, cover your ass and just say, you shouldn't dive anymore. They may go back and dive, but it's probably best for you to say, you know what, you were having symptoms before, this could be a harbinger of bad things, you should probably go ahead and stop diving. And then if the patients are sick, rapid transport. Yes, you want to go to a hyperbarics chamber, but if I'm in Jacksonville, I'm probably not going to just be calling Hilo to go to Orlando like that. I'm probably going to have to stabilize and resuscitate this patient and then try to get into a hyperbaric center. And then call Dan. I think Dan's a good uh, resource to have uh, to call if you need any help with this. And again, that's that link that we talked about that has handout, has all my contact information. I'll hopefully get the recording of lecture up there this week. And I will stick around for a little bit, and I welcome any questions, and I thank you guys very much.